Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. And I guess my uh, dear wife, Michelle, that delivered some uh, lemon tea has done great things for my throat and too much talking. I'm feeling much better. Uh, along with, of course, taking our Nutrameds. And now we're joined uh, on the road with John Moore, who's probably one of the best investigators. He's done some amazing stories that he's brought not only to his show, The Liberty Man, um, but also to our program and uh, expanded those. He's also brought over Professor McCanny, who we did a special a couple days ago on the effect of comments on sun superstorms and the kill shot. And we have major updates from Ann, who will be talking next. John, what's happening on the road? What uh, what kind of stories are you well, following uh, lately? In the last hour, Dr. Bill, I got a message from my uh, FEMA insider, a high-level FEMA insider, a rather cryptic message. He said, uh, he said the following. Uh, he said we should uh, get ready uh, for our battle, basically. Uh, he, he, he told us to uh, get re- assume our battle positions. Um, he also said that there's going to be a, a, another one or more major uh, shooting events, high casualty events, that will be contrived. Uh, just get ready as soon as we can to uh, deal with what's coming at us. That's basically his message. He's working 20 hours a day. We were out of contact with him for more than a week. We were getting a bit worried, but uh, he got back in touch with us, and well, hopefully he'll stay in touch on a more frequent basis now. Yeah, there's three things that I think need to be done for what I call the uh, uh, the uh, Patriot Network that believes that we have should contain our Second Amendment that should never be impinged upon. And that, by the way, means uh, none of this foolishness about universal gun registry and all this other stuff. We need to let people be responsible Americans. Obviously, you don't sell to someone who's a psychotic or a criminal or whatever, but leave it up to Americans. Uh, if you, um, as soon as you have a gun registry, and the thing is they always want to up the ante. I mean, the reason why the police went from, uh, you know, went from from regular, you know, six-round guns up to semi-automatic weapons is they were outgunned by the criminals. Uh, and, of course, if the government has advanced weapons and you don't have them, uh, you don't have an equal fight. It's like taking a knife to a gunfight. It's uh, stupid. Absolutely. So the point is that the reason why you have them is not because you're hunting. It's because you have to defend yourself against a rogue government that thinks in 2015 it's perfectly fine to target your home or your person because under NDAA, if you're considered an ally, ally, a very vague term, uh, with a uh, terrorist group, maybe uh, you happen to be in a parking lot at Walmart and you're seen with uh, Anwar al-Awlaki's cousin and they got a satellite photo of you and they said, look damn it his car is parked beside Amor al Salaki's cousin so they can hit you with a hellfire missile 75 miles away you don't even know it's coming in because it's going beyond the speed of sound so That's you don't right. hear the sound of a missile you hear the sound of wings of angels because you're dead now this is not a normal government Obama is a crazy bastard the lawyers behind him are as or even crazier to try to draw up all kinds of twisted psychological and legal arguments to try to support their craziness and it should only go through a court of law if somebody is actually allowing themselves to be uh, quote an enemy of the state arrest them bring them to court and go through the rules of evidence and the proper trial by, by jury of his peers but this idea that you're going to kind of say you know you know like the ancient right of kings it's like off with their heads like the king the queen of hearts and uh, alice right. wonderland this is not you know the um that was struck down in 1641 uh, by the British Parliament, and they struck it down. They said, you can't have a star chamber and just kill people because you don't like them. Uh, this is what we have right now. We have a Saturday, or sorry, Tuesday morning situation room where we have a star chamber where this, this slinky, slimy maniac we call our president sits in there with the baseball cards of death. And by the way, when they kill one person, they usually kill dozens and hundreds of other people that have nothing to do with the so-called terrorism, their kids or relatives. They can even be EMTs trying to save the bodies of the people that are blown to bits. And they usually do what's called a second strike. So they're not happy with just killing people on the, on the scene of, say, a wedding party in Pakistan. No, no, no. They're going to kill the EMTs that come to the ambulance afterward to help the, the people that are bleeding or dying. That's what terrorists do, Dr. Bill. Yeah, uh, to be I, honest with you, the I worst terrorists in the world right now, the worst terrorists in the world now is governments. And the worst government terrorism group is America. We are the biggest bastards 
on earth and we have to face up to it and other nations who don't understand that and this includes nations like china and russia that think they're real big and bad like the chinese rising i sat in an in, in, in underground at the july 10th 1994 and a four-star general told me that we can push a button and with our space-based weapons platforms an entire nation of china will cease to exist and everyone in it will die instantly without firing one missile or one bullet and people right. don't understand that they don't understand how twisted and, and satanic our so-called leaders are and the real leaders aren't obama he's the actor in chief that pre plays the i call the role of the <laughs> the 4d movie called the president okay All right this guy is no more a president than uh, some guy you know mr sheen that plays president on, on a, a tv series well dr bill I, I do have to go but i got the direct quote here how my uh, insider fema insider began our conversation very yeah. cryptic message uh, General quarters, general quarters. This is not a drill. He's really trying to get our attention. Right. Uh, wow. And with that, I, I have to move on here to another project I'm working on. But uh, you and Ann have a great show. Thanks a lot, John. I think we're going to have some okay. big announcements next week too. Um, well, you probably will. <laughs> absolutely. And I guess and you okay. know what, you guys are going to be able to do the show alone because I'm going to have my birthday next uh, Friday, on the third hour. So you're going to be co-hosting okay. the show. Hopefully, well, you're back on a good landline. No We've done it before. Well, you, you do a fantastic show. job as always. Thank, thank you. Talk to you soon. Yeah, great. Um, and give us some updates. You've got you've done some remarkable research today. I mean, we talked earlier, and you pulled up some new research about the uh, the three big comets passing uh, Earth, and in and the inner solar system. And according to Dr. McCanny, uh, in over the many centuries that that monks, ancient high priests, and the Vatican have been watching, and all of their telescopes are comet telescopes. That they're not only harbinger of death because if you pass through the tail of these, they contain cyanide and other neurotoxins, but also they trigger off earthquakes, volcanoes, extreme weather, and when they pass the sun because they're plasma objects, they trigger the largest superstorms on the sun. And in fact, read on uh, Dr. McCanny's website, he shows an actual NASA picture of a comet passing the sun causing a superstorm. So it's not just a theory, it's a fact, okay? So people need to understand. I don't know when the date is when the kill shot that's going to affect Earth, but the globalists probably have a pretty damn good idea because they know the orbits of these comets coming in. There's three this year, so NASA's called this the year of the comet, the one passing in October uh, past Mars and in toward the inner solar system and the sun thereafter in November is going to be 16 times brighter than the moon. That's going to be a big deal. So, yeah, we're going to be able to see it here, and right now they can, well, they'll be able to see it in the southern hemisphere uh, sooner. Right. Now, you've done some amazing research on three areas. First off is what I call the 15th of February, which is the Ides of February, Dr. Deagle's birthday, you know, weird enough. And it, it was rated up in size. I'm not going to steal your thunder. Tell us the story about that. Then you they also have, believe it or not, today while we're doing the show, we have extreme weather here in California. We've had flash floods, hailstorms. It's so crazy. I've never seen weather like this uh, well, in Southern California. And uh, tell us about that. And then, of course, then we got all this new information about the third area that you want to cover. So let's get rolling on that. Okay. Uh, well, there was a CME, and it was uh, it was very unusual CME. That's a coronal mass ejection. And it was unusual in that it lasted for 30 Minutes, thirty minutes, nine. I mean, sorry, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes is that, that's a very, that's a very long uh, surge. How, how long is the average? I think it's just a matter of seconds. So this is probably one of the longest CME surges in what decades or or longer. Well, this is what I would call a long duration CME, and it came in on the. It was emitted with a flare on the sixth of February. Wow. And we think that it's coming in today or tomorrow, and it will that's have an impact on the weather. Right. That's the plasma. That's the plasma. Yeah. Back in just a moment with Anne. Welcome back, and, uh, and uh, let's continue. Uh, with the uh, CME coming, we're probably going to have some extreme weather. We have some, basically all the flights of the Northeast canceled and two feet of snow in Boston. 
Uh, it's likely that the weather is going to be, you know, extremified or made even worse by the CME because it perturbs the upper atmosphere and the ionosphere. It also means that uh, energy can to be a little extra bump of energy hit the tectonic plate. So if there's a about to be an earthquake, a volcanic eruption or something, it's likely to happen. Um, <clears throat> space weather is a primary trigger for events on Earth. And according to the thesis of Dr. McKinney, alignments of the planets with large comets, um, strikes by comets and asteroids are very important. And of course, passage of comets near the sun are the major triggers for superstorms in the sun and we call the kill shot. Now I know Major Ed Dames has talked about this. I've been talking about it for many years as well. That space weather is a really big deal and it's something that we play down and the reason why I'm so interested in space weather is I became the next down to the commander George Swinder, the uh, next down in, at CECOM back in 1994 and I got Q-level security clearance US, US Space Command Strategic Defense and Star Wars. So I got to see things firsthand that are so classified unless you're the president or a senior member of the military, you're not going to know about these things, and they're not imaginary. Um, there's a wall between Tier 1 science, as Professor McKinney says in Tier 2. What you do, uh, and is really remarkable, because you pierce through that by pulling references that are in the literature or in the media, and you actually put together a very plausible picture that things like strobing the Earth with ultraviolet light, that's very bad for plants, and the benthic layer of the oceans to generate uh, phytoplankton, generate oxygen that um, surges of magnetic fields that can cause earthquakes, volcanoes, and affect people's behavior, etc., cetera, um, is bad. And uh, that in fact, you can have some major catastrophes, including you know, extreme weather, triggered off by space weather that can be very catastrophic or even extinction level. So uh, let's continue, because you've got this CME. What do you think is going to happen in the next few days uh, with this CME? And how is it going to instruct us if we have, let's say, a comet-activated superstorm with a really big CME that could happen as early as this fall or sometime during the year? And there's three comets that we now know their orbital pathway that you sent me as well, which I'll post up, that I'm sure the globalists with their fancy computers could probably predict not only the passage time when it gets close enough to the moon to, to the sun to get an arc of plasma and a superstorm, but we'll also have a pretty good idea if there's any active sunspots that are maybe aimed to be Earth-centric that'll surge in a million, trillions of tons of plasma toward the Earth and cause a major perturbation of our magnetic field, maybe crack the magnetosphere, strobe the Earth with solar wind and high-energy cosmic particles and gamma rays. And um, let's make life on Earth very nasty. Um, what does this mean, that what's going to happen this weekend? And what's likely to happen in the fall if we happen to be Earth-centric to a comet-activated kill shot superstorm on the sun? Yeah, uh, well, we had a uh, C9 flare on the 6th, and it was uh, in the central part of the solar disk, but not on the It was north of the horizon. It was north at 22 degrees out of 90. And uh, so it's Earth-bound. And it hit immediately, but it was only a C9, and it didn't uh, have much impact. However, at the same time, a CME was uh, generated and sent towards the Earth. Now, the CME will not travel as fast as the flare. The flare will get here within minutes. The CME uh, takes two or three days to get here. A CME is a coronal mass ejection. And what that is is a very complicated, very strong, very intricate magnetic field. Now, this CME, although it was generated at a C9 level, was of long duration. It was 10 minutes long. And you just think about it, it's going to be hitting the magnetosphere. Now, the magnetosphere protects us from the solar particles that are streaming all the time towards us. Well, you know sunlight occurs, so there's other things streaming along with that sunlight. <laughs> and uh, what happens when the CME, especially a long-duration CME, comes in is that it will actually crack the magnetosphere. What happens is that that very intricate, very complicated, very intense magnetic field will hit the magnetosphere and break the lines of uh, magnetic force, and that will let in what's called the solar wind. 
and that'll let in protons, electrons, uh, UV, and um, other particles that are part of the solar wind, part of the uh, energy that comes from the sun. Now, this being 10 minutes long, it, if it opens a crack, and I think that it will, then that streaming will continue for up to 10 minutes. In doing so, the CME will continue to push on the magnetosphere, and uh, so we will have movement of the magnetic lines of force. And you need to put your electronic products into a Faraday uh, cage. Uh, that is a, uh, well, I use a galvanized steel trash can, and I line it with a blanket, and then I put, uh, well, I'll put my cell phone in there and, and other things that are, are uh, likely to be shorted out by the magnetic field moving through them. We know that the magnetic field will move through our brains and create current, so you can expect bizarre behavior. And because there's a crank in the magne magnetosphere, there will be, um, the, the atmosphere will be heated, well, I, I don't want to say heated, it will be energized by the solar wind, and that will make extreme weather events uh, very strong. Now, we have, a, we have a bombogenesis going on on the East Coast. We're getting a, a northeaster, nor'easter, as they say, and it could make it uh, even stronger than it's going to be. It's already going to be at record strength. And it could make it even stronger than than it than it than they think that it'll be. They're talking about hundred mile hour winds. They're talking about uh, a dozen, uh, well, like uh, two two feet of snow or three feet of snow. Uh, they've already canceled travel on uh, highways in Massachusetts. So basically, so, this is going to stop rail traffic, road traffic. It's going to probably bring down power lines. Yes, the, the other thing that the CME does is that it will create uh, currents in long lines, and so anything that has an antenna attached to it will uh, possibly become energized. Uh, your car, uh, because it's steel, will uh, be a sink for the magnetic lines of force, and you'll get a induced electric current, so you don't... You don't want to touch your car. You can be inside of it, but I wouldn't get outside. And if you do touch it, you might be, it would be like a static electricity jolt, and it would probably be hot. So if you yeah. drew up to a uh, fuel pump and opened the door, you'd get that spark that might set your car on fire. Yeah, now, so in, in other words, if you just happen to be unlucky enough that the 10-minute surge happened when you're gassing up, it uh, might be a real bad idea to touch the gas pump at that time. And not only that, it will go through the brain, and it will create currents where there should not be currents, and you'll get bizarre behaviors. Yeah. I.e., the tinfoil hat people. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Believe it or not, it's a time when people should be carrying uh, hats with a little Faraday cage in them, and that That's Faraday right. cages around your electronic equipment and so on is a real good idea, and we have them over at Less EMF, all kinds of very nice little uh, things you can do something as simple as a aluminum trash can but you want to get Faraday cages for your electronics because it's not only the year of the comet it's the year of the sea welcome back and uh, you do such a great job and uh, one of the things that I've discovered is one of the most popular hours of the week is this uh, uh, hour we call preparedness civil defense martial law which by the way includes uh, a bank holiday the lowest level of martial laws you know I <laughs> like uh, when you, you see uh, uh, some of the experts in this break into song, you know, holiday, you know, like it's a bank holiday. And uh, it's not a holiday. Uh, it's basically credit cards don't work, can't get gas, can't get groceries, can't go to the restaurant, can't go to the movies because you don't have cash at home and they don't want to take gold or silver coins. Um, so this is a big deal, the uh, whole issue of comments. We're going to have more information as time goes on. And, I'm hoping to do some more video, perhaps even over the weekend, on the live stream channel, so check that out. Anybody who's been a customer of Nutramedical gets access um, to the live stream channels. We're going to be doing a lot more uh, multi-site conferences and other things on the live stream channel. Uh, anything more to talk about these comments right now? What about the big one that's coming up in the fall? Any uh, information on that? Yeah, that's um, nicknamed ISON, A I S. Hmm. ISON, and it's going to uh, pass by the sun very, very close. I mean, it's going to be, uh, it's going to 
fly through the sun's outer atmosphere at 745,000 miles from the stellar surface below. So they think that it might be a uh, sun diver. And in other words, it might fall into the sun. The sun might oh, just my. grab it. But if the comet survives the encounter, it, it would emerge glowing as brightly as the moon, visible near the sun. So we'd have two suns in the sky. And uh, uh, the, it says the, the comet's dusty tail stretching into the night would create a worldwide sensation. Yeah, and by the way, you know that, what they call that second sun? What? They call it the morning star. And you know oh, who the morning star is? Yeah, morning star, basically, it's a... It's a reference uh, uh, to Satan. They call it the Satan star. Oh, okay. So if um, you look into occult uh, areas, including the ancient priesthood in Sumer and Egypt, they see the sign of the second star in the sky as a sign of the change in the age and uh, a major destruction coming to the planet. Well, well that's, that's possible because it's going to be so close. I mean, you're talking... 745,000 miles from the that surface is, uh, of the sun. I mean, that that is like... That's inside uh, the sun's inner heliosphere. So it, it's, it's likely to have an impact on the sun. That is, it will have a gravitational attraction to... Uh, well, let's say that there was an incipient flare, and it might set off a flare. or it might. And if Earth is in the way, it could set off a uh, kill shock. That would hit yeah. the earth. Now, I know they use a technique called remote viewing, and I, and I don't necessarily want to say I endorse all the stuff, but what people have to understand is that the, a, a human being is a multidimensional being. We have a physical body that's limited to the five dimensions of our lower realm. And people, what are the five? You know, the three dimensions of distance and space. Then the fourth dimension is called time space, which Einstein delineated in his special theory of relativity. The fifth dimension is called the torsion field, which basically curves time-space to create things like wormholes, the uh, black holes in the center of the galaxy and throughout the universe that are even moving, uh, and of course the emergence of what's called white holes, believe it or not. People realize that, that, that matter and energy re-emerge, so at the center of every galaxy is 2.5% of the mass of the galaxy. The uh, stars actually have white holes emerging new mass and energy into them, linked up like lights in a Christmas tree. And in fact, it's thought that the torsion field, the time-space field, the fifth-dimensional field exists before planets like Jupiter and the Earth, and that the torsion field actually agglomerated and brought energy and mass together to actually create the planets and to create the stars. Those torsion fields existed before the stars didn't just, you know, in other words, gravity and the Higgs boson and so on had to actually pull that mass together of interstellar dust, etc., or transport through wormholes the mass and energy to literally create the planets. So uh, the process isn't just kind of a random thing where this giant cloud of, of dust decides to suddenly become gravitationally active, swirl around and become a planet or a star system, that in fact uh, it's an active process. And galaxies are actually, if you want to call birthing stations or uteri for creating stars. Stars are not independent of the black hole. They're actually umbilically connected to it. Uh, that's an interesting theory, isn't it? Well, uh, yeah. You know, I was really worried when they were working with that uh, with that black hole generator over there on the Swiss-France border. Well, well <laughs> you know, what they're doing there, too, is they've, they've got a new device that they're building that'll be re ready in 2018, and that's a new uh, tokamak. And their tokamak's going to be the largest one in history. It'll be about four to five times bigger than the one in San Diego here. The largest one in the world uh, is in Britain right now, uh, called a JET. I'm not sure of all what each of the terms lands for, but the largest tokamaks in Britain. And they use powerful magnetic fields rather than gravitational fields in order to converge the mass. And they're using hydrogen rather than helium-3. The problem is, you see, Tier 2 scientists have access to a certain level of knowledge. Uh, what they've been doing for decades now is mining helium-3, which is a natural byproduct of the nuclear reaction on the surface of the sun. And Dr. McCanny talked about this, Professor McCanny, that the nuclear reaction, if you look at the research data he's seen, the center of the sun is not the hardest part of the sun. The hardest part of the sun is, is uh, in the plasma field around the sun. And in fact, helium-3 is generated by the reactions, the nuclear reactions there of nuclear fusion. And 
<clears throat> the helium-3, in fact, is used as a fusion fuel for our miniaturized tokamak reactors that are in our Aurora space fleet. And uh, we already conquered this 40 years ago. Um, the fact is that they're not, the globalists don't want to pass this information on because we already have access to star power energy. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's, an, it's an ongoing problem where we don't need to be worried about tied to fossil fuels. The problem with fossil fuels, they call it, which really isn't. I mean, small amounts of fossil, mostly abiotic. If you burned all of the oil in Venezuela, you, the oxygen concentration of the earth would drop to zero or pretty damn close to it. Uh, we'd all choke to death, let's put it that way. You couldn't turn on your car because without oxygen, it doesn't work. Uh, so we don't have a problem with, we have a problem with what's called peak oxygen. If you, everybody decided to, you know, energize and drive SUVs or just regular cars, and we keep on cutting down the rainforest and poisoning the oceans and killing the benthic layer, the uh, world ha doesn't have lungs anymore. And it's hard to breathe without lungs. Think of the ocean surface and the rainforest and the grassy lands as the lungs of Earth. And by the way, whenever you generate oxygen from those lungs, you, if you're burning it off, for example, one A380, which is the Air Airbus, uh, uses up in one hour more oxygen than all the human beings on Earth breathe and use to support their biology. One hour. Wow. So I want people to understand that I'm the first that I know of to speak uh, powerfully about the whole issue of peak oxygen. It's a big damn problem. Now the solution is not crazy old nuclear technology where you boil water with fusion reactors. It's not going to thorium reactors or even the most advanced of the one that Pebble Bed or the old Canadian can do. It's getting to tokamak fusion reactors, which they'll pretend is not going to happen until 2040 or 2030 or God knows when. We already have it, but they don't want to let it out to the people because their goal, and this is what I'm going to talk about for a second here, I call it um, Scenario X. Scenario X leads to Reason Y and to what's called World War Z. Now, of course, next summer we got Brad Pitt talking about World War Z, but people don't want to accept this, but the fact is the globalists consider us the zombies. We're already zombies in their mind. In other words, why harden the power grid? As, as Hillary Rotten Clinton says, you know, what does it matter if there's four guys going out in the night and they decide to just kill a bunch of Americans or if they're terrorists? What does it matter if you harden the grid, if we want all the people in America mostly to die except a few survivalists? What does it matter? Because, you see, we're being led by Satanists. Now, people say, oh, Dr. Deagle, they're not really that evil. These people actually think they're good. They think they're the conservers of civilization. They've kept a seed vault in Svalbard Island in Norway. They have um, kept a uh, list of people that they want to have as breeding stock of human beings, various cultures on Earth. They've tried to sequester all the knowledge on Earth and underground uh, cities and special recording media. Uh, they consider themselves the high priest of the modern era. Uh, and Bill Gates is right there at the top with all these other characters with trillions of dollars of money and resources to live in their, quote, hotels, they call them, underground. And when people think that this is a conspiracy theory, you're not paying attention. Back in a moment. In the last segment here, I want to kind of um, get into some of the things about this asteroid that's coming by. But the scenario X uh, it leads to what we call question reason why, which is what the globalist reasons. And you have to get inside the twisted minds of these people and realize they don't think they're doing evil. They think they actually have to have the guts, like the ceremony of the burning of care in uh, Bohemian Grove, so that they can actually preserve civilization by saying, you know, it's, it's time to let civilization just die. Don't save them. In fact, they may actually interfere with our survival if enough of them survive and have guns to fight back from us. And by the way, we better have, if we can't rely on our troops, we better have predator drones so we can be sitting in a bunker a mile down or more, and we can fire off these drones and fire a Hellfire missile and blow somebody up at their little campment or hit their berm shelter uh, with a Hellfire missile uh, or directed energy weapon from space or whatever, if they're still working before the big bad stuff happens to make certain that they won't interfere with us and maybe plug our air intake vents that are on military bases surrounded by the, the few suicidal uh, troops that want to stay on the surface to make sure that we're fine in our hotels underground. So the reason why is basically they think they're going to preserve civilization beyond a, a extinction-level event, which obviously they think they know when it's going to be, 
Uh, they also think that they're going to start, if you want to call it, the devil is, has uh, hijacked the book of Revelation, if you want to call it. And uh, they want to precipitate, you know, World War Z. They're doing predictive programming, even with movies like Brad Pitt, which is obviously, he's either very stupid or very evil, and I happen to choose number two. He's a very evil man. And uh, for him to say these kind of things or go be involved with these movies, because what celebrities do when they do this, they're endorsing the idea that, you know, that the, the real issue isn't zombies, it's the citizens that survive. The real issue is all of us to the globalists are already walking dead. Uh, and they, they, they base that on that their diets are better and that they are they go into hyperbolic chambers and so their brains are better. And, uh, no, so they base it on something else. They base it on the fact that they've gone through what's called a diet of devils. They've been uh, the most powerful thing you can do in high-level masonry and whatever culture you're talking about, whether it's uh, in the the, the uh, Shinto temples in Japan or the uh, you know China, and you deal with the various monks levels, or or if you go to uh, Tibet or you go to the high levels of Roman Catholicism and deal with the high levels of demonic worship, etc. What you discover basically is every single one of them is actually doctrines of devils. And uh, the ancient priesthood, going back from Sumer and Egypt, right back to Atlantis and before, uh, basically believed that the most powerful thing to do is to curse your own bloodline. So you curse your own bloodline to a thousand generations, and it's more powerful than killing millions. And what that means is you've literally hand over your own bloodline uh, to be avatared by demonic entities to control civilization. So what we have is civilization has been controlled by people of clay and iron. Clay being human flesh and iron being the iron of these very powerful and then very super intelligent dark uh, spirits that actually avatar control those human beings, uh, inspiring them, giving them ideas, giving them technology, giving them prophetic uh, knowledge as well, giving them supernatural gifts of physical, emotional, and intellectual capacity that makes them able to do things that other people think are impossible. It doesn't mean everybody that's remarkable is is demon possessed, but the fact is that when you look at the globalists, if you look at, say, the uh, Rhodes Scholarships, um, they do special tests to see after they picked everybody that has an IQ over 185 and they get, make them a Rhodes Scholar like Bill Clinton. And then about 10% of the people they do uh, goes through a psychological test and they're proven to be socio-psychopaths. Basically, they're devoid of conscience. And those people get a carte blanche, which basically means anything you want, like that uh, commercial, you know, anything, you know, <laughs> the devil. <laughs> Yeah. Well, guess what? They get anything, you know, whether it's sex, money, power, or whatever. They get whatever they want. And um, that's the, the devil's, uh, you know, that's the, the uh, what do they call that? The, the devil's deal, the blood deal. In fact, I, I saw a commercial on the Super Bowl that showed a guy about to sign to get this real fancy vehicle from somebody playing the devil. He's the guy that played the, um, the goblin on uh, Batman. Very good. D D William Defoe, you know, excellent... Uh, player for, for playing the bad guy, although back in the 80s he played Jesus. And Wave Defoe was playing the devil, and all of a sudden he saw a commercial outside on a billboard and realized, no, I don't need to have this de devil, and of course he disappears in a black cloud of dust. Uh, the devil, he was ticked off, you know, he didn't get his deal. Well, the globalists for thousands of generations have been doing this. They've been making deals with the devils. And uh, people don't believe in what we call parallel reality and hyperdimensionality and so on. They just don't understand the nature of what they are, the nature of our Creator God, the nature of the opposition of a vast universe of intelligent memes and beings that are not by any means human. And uh, that's one of the big defects of our civilization. In fact, the greatest thing that the devil's done is to prove to most people that he doesn't exist. Okay. Well, we we know about those things from the Bible. We know right, that. Right, but, uh, but people think the Bible is kind of like a like a children's story. Like, oh, you believe in the Bible, Deagle? Man, I thought you were intelligent. What's wrong with you? You you really? I, I've lost it, man. I don't I don't trust you anymore. I mean, all your medical advice. How can you believe in that foolishness in the Bible? And they'll pull up all kinds of stuff that misinterprets it. Of course, the Bible interprets itself. And if you look at a culture, you also have, you have to remember that people were writing from their own cultural perspective as well. But the Bible is a hyperdimensional book that goes beyond space-time because the scribes that wrote it, they wrote some of their own stuff in it, but it was basically authored by God. And what he was basically telling us here about our time, which is where we are now, is that we're going to be facing the final great war. 
this final great war is in heaven right now, and it's going to come down to you, earth. It says, woe to you, earth, and you see, for the devil and his minions have come down to you. Uh, and that's about to happen. I believe that the globalists are all, they're ready. This third millennium, man, this is our millennium. This is the devil's millennium. That's what they want. And that's why I say scenario X leads to their reason why and leads to World War Z, which is why next summer, you know, when you see Homeland Security doing what we call zombie drills all around the country, it's not by chance it's, it's all the zombie wars and all the zombie stuff on, like, you know, uh, uh, what's that name? The name of that movie was recently, uh, I don't know, I thought it was quite funny, uh, but it's bizarre, right? Is mm-hmm. uh, the one that's called uh, Paranorman. It tries to make you think, oh, the zombies aren't bad. They're just people that went wrong and need to come back and repent and everything's cool. No. <clears throat> they, they, they basically take, try to take people's natural fear <laughs> natural fear away. So what do you think of that thesis? Does it make sense as to, when you analyze the overall behavior of what I see happening, the scientific hiding, for example, under Obama, uh, we talked about this on Wednesday with uh, Keisha Rogers, he has basically dismantled the last part, public part of our space program. Well, I think that uh, I think that there is a widening gap between the rich and the poor, and uh, one of the implications of that is that the the poor are eating less protein and the rich are eating more protein, and that has it, an it, effect it, it, on intelligence and on growth and on understanding. It, well, even the uh, global elite, they eat food that's organic and doesn't have GMO and all the other stuff. But I'm saying it's much more than that. It's a, a bifurcation of science, culture, and the nature of reality. See, they believe that they, because they are a predator superclass that are enveloped by demonic beings, they're the only real humans. The word human, by the way, is a Welsh word meaning serpent man. So if you have to talk, to talk to even the high-level satanic Jews that believe that they are following the cockatrice or the feathered serpent, they actually believe that they're serpent men. The current Sabbatean Jews believe they're serpent men. They're clay and iron. They're not the Jews of the ancient Bible that marched, marched around uh, Jericho and made the walls fall. No, no, we're talking about serpent man. And Jesus would say they're a synagogue of Satan. And the high-level Satanists, if you go inside a satanic temple, you'll see Hebrew symbols everywhere. Like the star that's in there, they call it the Star of David. That's not the Star of David. That's the Star of Ashtarte, which is the uh, the uh, spring ceremony of human sacrifice. So the symbol over Israel is a symbol of human sacrifice. The Star of David. Isn't that bizarre? Is, is that the six-pointed star? Yes, it is. It's called a Sinzigi. And the Sinzigi is a satanic symbol of human sacrifice. I thought the five part, five pointed star was. That, that's uh, another symbol of Satan. That's a symbol of, uh, of, um, uh, the, of the devil. He has, both symbols are his. Oh, the five pointed okay. star with the two horns upward is the, is the, the horn god of the underworld. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Oh dear. Interesting, well, eh? Oh, oh my. Hey, is, is, Friday, Alice would wonder I would say, oh me, oh my. I mean, when you get to the world of, of uh, Alice okay, in Wonderland next, or. Next Friday, we may see that asteroid flashing through the sky. Well, uh, the you'll be doing the show with, uh, with John, so you'll have a lot more time to talk. But this uh, one gonna, whipping by is going to be. Uh, it's going to be five BA football 14. fields. Yeah, five times the football field. And we wonder if it's going to hit any of our communication satellites or it's going to change weather or break up like Tunguska and cause a major super flash in the upper atmosphere. Who's to know? It's going to be interesting. Take care and take action and pray after you do.